Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, welcome back to another American government lecture. Today, uh, we begin the final two, maybe three, lectures on the court system in the United States. And uh, then we will take our final exam. So uh, let's start with uh, Roman numeral one, as you can see, uh, judiciary in the Constitution. <clears throat> so write it down. Article one of the Constitution is the legislative article. It is the longest and most detailed article, probably reflecting the fact that the Founding Fathers wanted Congress to be the most dominant branch of government. That's why they made it longest and most detailed. Article 2 of the Constitution is the executive branch article. It is the second longest and second most detailed article. Okay, second longest, second most detailed article. Article 3 of the Constitution is the judicial article and it is the shortest and least detailed article. So, what is in Article 3? We are looking in Article 3 for the term judicial review. Okay? B in your outline says judicial review. So that is what we are searching for. And if we were in a classroom situation, I will have one of you read Article 3, and then I will interrupt them to tell the rest of you to write it down. Since we are not in a classroom situation, I will read Article 3, and then I will tell you to write it down. So here we go. If you can follow along, it's section one, right beneath the video, you can follow along what it says. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So, what does that mean? Write it down. Only the Supreme Court is mentioned in the Constitution. Other lower federal courts are created and reorganized by Congress. Okay? Let's continue. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Okay, so what does that mean? Write it down. Federal judges serve for life. They serve for life. They receive a salary that may not be decreased, only increased. Now, why is it? Because they want the judiciary to be independent from the executive. Say the judges make a decision 
that the judiciary, that the legislature doesn't like, then the legislature, if they are allowed to reduce a salary, will punish them by reducing their salary. That's why their salary can only be increased and not decreased. So let's move on to section two. All right? Let me scroll down for you. All right, so let's read section two. What are the powers of the judicial branch of government? The judicial power, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. So, write it down. The jurisdiction of the Supreme Court extends to the following areas. A, the Constitution, laws made under it, and treaties made under it. Okay? Let's continue. To all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. So B, B, to cases that involve ambassadors, high-ranking government officials, and consuls. To all cases of admiralty, maritime jurisdiction. So we'll write it down. C, to cases that involve U.S. territorial waters to cases to which the United States shall be a party, to cases which the United States shall be a party, so write it down, D, cases that involve the state suing the U.S. federal government. To controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between states, between citizens of the same state claiming land under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizen thereof and foreign subjects, citizens or subjects. So what does that mean? Write it down. <clears throat> to cases that involve two states suing each other, to cases that involve citizens of one state suing the government of another state, to cases that involve citizens of two different states suing each other, and finally, to cases that involve foreign citizens suing the United States. All right? So let me scroll down some more. All right. Let's continue. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. This is very important. Okay? Let me explain. Write it down. In cases that involve the federal government, in cases that involve two states suing each other, in cases that involve the federal government getting sued by a state, okay, 
the Supreme Court shall be the first to hear the case. Original jurisdiction. So, let's take a hypothetical example. Let's say uh, the state of Arizona sued the state of California over the water of the Colorado River, right? Over the waters of rivers. Uh, this case will immediately go to the federal Supreme Court. Okay? Let's take another example. Let's say uh, Texas sued the federal government over immigration. They said immigration is costing us too much money. The federal government is not doing its job. We're suing you. The Supreme Court will be the first to hear the case. This is known as original jurisdiction. Okay? Continue. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. Okay? In all other cases that I mentioned to you, that I read you, the Supreme Court will hear the case on appeal, on appeal, either from a lower federal court, lower federal court, or from a state Supreme Court. All right? Final section that says the trial. Okay? The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trials shall be held in the state where the crimes shall have been committed, but when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as Congress may by law have directed. Okay? Write it down. All trials in the United States shall be by jury, a jury of your alleged peers. Okay? So now, let's ask this question. During my recitation of uh, this uh, Article 3, did we come across the term judicial review? Was it there? The answer is no. There is no mention of judicial review. Why is that? Because judicial review is not in the Constitution. It's not there. So what is judicial review and how did it come about? Write it down. Judicial review is the power of any federal court to declare an executive action, an act of Congress, or a state action unconstitutional. Okay? That is judicial review. So, where did it come about? Well, judicial review is not in the Constitution. It is, in another word, extra-constitutional. It is a power that the Supreme Court acquired when it decided a case. Well, which case? Here it is. Under Judicial Review 1, Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison. So, find out on your own, 
find out on your own who were the five people involved in Marbury versus Madison? Who were the five people involved in it? What was the case about? Why was Marbury suing Madison? How was the case decided? And how did the Supreme Court acquire judicial review from it? Okay? Roman numeral two, periods in constitutional interpretation. Now, please pay attention to this because it's very important. Write it down. Whenever a judge decides a case, he or she is inevitably making law, okay? He or she is inevitably making law. This is especially true at the federal level, okay? Okay, so as I said, whenever a judge decides a case, uh, especially at the federal level, they are making law. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Back in 2008, California voters voted a proposition called Proposition 8. Proposition 8. Now, what does Proposition 8 do, or what did it do? Proposition 8 denied, denied the right of gay people to get married. Okay? It said marriage is between a man and a woman, uh, gay people should not be married, and it passed by the voters, something around like 55 to 60 percent of the voters voted for it. Uh, there was a lawsuit by a gay couple against it, saying that Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. It went to a U.S. district judge, his name is Vaughn Walker, okay? And he looked at Proposition 8, and he said it violates, it violates the 14th Amendment under the Constitution. Now, the 14th Amendment says uh, it has equal protection under the law, and it has due process under the law. And, it's, and he said Proposition 8 violates both the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause, and he declared it unconstitutional. When he made that decision, when he made that decision, he was in effect making law. He was saying that gay marriage shall be legal in California. Okay? Shall be legal in California. Upon appeal, the Ninth Circuit Court, it was appealed to them, and then after that, there was an appeal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court agreed that Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. But the point remains that that judge was making law. Okay? Clear? We continue. Write it down. Moreover, Whenever a judge decides a case, he or she is inserting their values, their beliefs, 
their assumptions, their biases, their ideologies, their bigotry into that case. Okay? In other words, judges are incapable of being impartial. Okay? They are incapable of being impartial. They are the product of their political socialization. Let me give you another example. This one is more recent. When the COVID-19 pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic began, States in California and in New York started placing restrictions on people congregating in places of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques. Why? Because they wanted to reduce the transmission of the virus. We now know that if you congregate in a closed environment with a lot of people, you are more than likely to spread the virus. So states said in California and in New York, we are going to limit this type of behavior, going to church, going to a synagogue, going to a mosque, to about 10 people or 25 people with adequate social distancing and mask wearing, okay? Religious conservatives objected. They said this is a violation of the First Amendment in the Constitution. At that time, the Supreme Court had five conservatives and four liberals. Okay? At that time, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. She hasn't died yet. So... The religious conservatives file lawsuits and upon appeal, it goes to the Supreme Court and by a five to four decision, the judges decide in favor of the states. The four liberals are joined by Judge Roberts. That gives them five to four. They decide in favor of the states, and they say, yes, in order to fight the pandemic, states are allowed to restrict religious gatherings. Okay? Then, more recently, Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a liberal on the court, dies. She died from cancer, okay? She's been battling cancer since 2009, and she died. So, Trump and the Republicans in the Senate appoint and confirm another religious conservative judge to replace her. Her name is Amy Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett. This person is a religious fundamentalist, highly conservative. So, Now you have the balance of power has shifted. Now you have six conservative and three liberals. 
Okay? So, religious groups who feel that their rights are being violated sue again. And it goes to the Supreme Court. Okay? Now, however, the decision is different. By a five to four decision, they decide in favor of those who are suing and against the states. So now the states can no longer restrict mass gatherings in synagogues and churches that spread the coronavirus pandemic. They cannot do it. So, do you see what happened here? You changed the values of the judges. And you inserted a new highly conservative judge. And that highly conservative judge used her values, her beliefs, her assumptions, her biases, her ideology, in order to get a favorable outcome that favored her thinking. Judges are partial. Judges are biased. Judges are just like you and me, a product of our political socialization. That is why, that is why, from FDR until Obama, that time period, 90% of a president's federal judicial appointments, 90%, had the same political ideology as that of the president. Okay? If judges, as we are always told, are impartial, then a judge who is liberal and appointed on the court can put their liberalism on the side and decide on the facts of the court. If judges are impartial, then a conservative judge can put their conservatism on the side and judge on the facts of the case. But that is not the case. Judges are partial. Judges have biases. Judges have ideologies. And they almost always insert them into their decisions. Is this clear? So, the cases that I will cover as I move forward, the cases that I will cover, will show you how judges insert their values into a case. So, let's begin. Okay, let's begin. A, from Marshall to Civil War. From Marshall to the Civil War. Number one, national economy, strong government. Let's begin. John Marshall was the second Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He was a Federalist from the Federalist Party. And as such, he had two important values, beliefs, Number one, 
he believed in the need for a strong federal government. And number two, he believed in the need for a national economy that is not influenced by state regulations. So he believed that state economic regulations should be kept at a minimum. Okay? That was his core belief. So, he gets a case, if you look on the lecture outline, called Gibbons versus Ogden. Gibbons versus Ogden. Okay? What is this case about? Ogden was granted a license under New York law to be the only operator of steamboats on the rivers of New York. Okay? He was given a license to be the only one to operate steamboats under the rivers of New York. Gibbons is a businessman who operates steamboats on the rivers of New York. Okay? So, now, Gibbons is out of business. He can't operate his steamboats on the rivers of New York because Ogden has a monopoly. The case goes to the Supreme Court in front of Judge Marshall. Judge Marshall, writing for a unanimous court, decides that the license is unconstitutional. That license that New York issued is unconstitutional. Why? Well, he says, logically, the rivers of New York connect to neighboring states and goods flowing on them are part of interstate commerce. And only the federal government can regulate interstate commerce and therefore the license issued by New York is unconstitutional. Okay? Get the logic? A ship has goods on it. It's on the rivers of New York. That is considered interstate commerce and only the federal government can regulate interstate commerce and therefore, the license is unconstitutional. All right? Throw it out. Now, let's ask this question. Did this decision reflect the values of Mr. Marshall? Did they reflect the values of Mr. Marshall? The answer is yes. This decision, number one, strengthened the federal government. It was in favor of the federal government. And number two, it undermined the ability of states to regulate the economy. And these values are core values of Mr. Marshall and other Federalists like him.
Second case. Dred Scott versus Sanford. That's B. This case deals with slavery. This case deals with slavery. Dred Scott was a slave from a southern state. Okay? His owner, Sandford, takes him on a trip to what was called back then the Northern Territories. Minnesota, Wisconsin. They were known as the Northern Territories. At that time, <clears throat> Congress has declared the Northern Territories slave-free. While in the Northern Territories, Sanford Sr. dies. Okay? He dies. Dred Scott logically says, my owner has died. I am in a non-slave territory. Therefore, I am free. Sanford's estate wants him returned to the slave state where he came from. With the help of others, Scott sues for his freedom. It goes to the Supreme Court with a new Chief Justice. His name was Roger Taney, T-A-N-Y. He's a Southerner. And he is supportive of states' rights, including the right to own slaves. What do you think he decides? He decides that slaves are property, just like any item that you see in this house. They have no rights, and therefore Scott must be returned to his rightful owners. Now, this decision led up to the Civil War, which leads us to period B, Government and Economy, 1860 to 1945. Within that period, there is a sub-period 1, 1860 to 1932. Write it down. Following the Civil War, the U.S. begins a period of sustained capitalist economic growth. In capitalism, in capitalism, The lack of government regulation, as was the case from 1860 to 1932, brings with it the concentration of wealth and power in fewer and fewer corporations. 
at that time, it brought with it the dominance of banks, the dominance of railroads, the dominance of oil corporations. We are in a similar period today, and we see the dominance of tech companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, okay, as well as the banks and financial institutions. So, during this 1860 to 1932 period, the Supreme Court became the principal protector of the large corporation. How? How did it become the principal protector of the large corporation. Heck, corporations are not even mentioned in the Constitution. So how did that come about? The answer is the 14th Amendment. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this is uh, section one below the video of the 14th Amendment. And there are two clauses in there that are very relevant that the Supreme Court used to extend protection to corporations. One of them is the due process clause, which says, nor shall any state deny any person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law and the other one is the equal protection clause which says nor shall any state deny any person the equal protection of the law now the key word here is person okay key word is person so write it down in the case of Santa Clara County versus Southern Railroad. Remember I told you railroad companies became dominant. The Supreme Court said that the word person in the 14th Amendment due process clause and equal protection clause also apply to corporations also apply to corporations and in that decision the supreme court created the doctrine that still lives today called corporate personhood in america a corporation is a person and has the same rights under the law that you do. Okay? Same rights. So, what was the implication of this Santa Clara County versus Southern Railroad decision? This decision denied federal and state governments the power to regulate corporate America, okay? In practice, it meant that the following became unconstitutional. The minimum wage was back then declared unconstitutional. Improving working conditions, you know, the eight hour work week, safety on the job, all that was declared unconstitutional. Uh, protecting consumers 
from unsafe products was also declared unconstitutional. All right? This love affair between the Supreme Court and corporations lasted until 1932. 1932. And that brings us to the second period that extends from 1932 to 1945 on our outline. So what happened in 1932? What was this seismic event that changed things? Write it down. In 1932, FDR was elected because of the Great Depression. Okay? And he had a plan to deal with the Great Depression known as the New Deal. Known as the New Deal. He basically wanted the federal government to do two basic functions. Create jobs, create jobs, okay? And regulate corporate behavior. So the government would create a works program to help people get a job and get a wage. And the government would regulate corporate behavior so that there will not be another Great Depression. Okay? Congress passed the New Deal. Okay? However, the Supreme Court, because of its love affair with corporations, declared the New Deal unconstitutional in 1935. Why? Because it violated, it violated the rights and liberties of corporations because under the law, corporations have become persons. In 1936, FDR was re-elected by a landslide. Okay? Democrats controlled both chambers of Congress in large numbers. So FDR simply suggested, didn't implement, simply suggested the following to Congress. Enlarge the Supreme Court Enlarge the Supreme Court from 9 to 15. Okay? Supreme Court is still at 9. But he said enlarge it from 9 to 15. And allow me, FDR, to appoint six new, six new pro-New Deal judges. Remember what I told you? about the ideologies and the values of judges determine the outcome of the cases. This is it. Allow me to appoint six new judges, giving me a majority on the court. Congress did not act on his proposition. Congress simply passed the new deal again. All right? This time, however, this time, however, the Supreme Court found that the New Deal is constitutional. All right? 
So what does that tell us about the Supreme Court? It tells us two things. Number one, number one, the Supreme Court is not that independent so much for judicial independence from the other branches. It's not that independent. It can easily be influenced by the executive branch or the legislative branch. And number two, number two, the Supreme Court sometimes makes decisions that are totally political and expedient in nature. This was one of them. Very expedient, very political decision. Bush versus Gore, the one that put Bush in the White House, that Supreme Court case, was also political and expedient. All right? Is this clear? All right. So we have come up on 51 minutes, actually about 52 minutes right now. So I will stop here, and we will continue under rights and liberties the next time. And on this note, I will say bye-bye.